I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and we're going to be doing a presentation tonight about different points of view of Christmas. The first to speak will be Charlie Paydock, talking about an ecological Christmas, and, how, and, it's, and it's the things I'm going to be talking about how you should celebrate Christmas and how much economically it generates. And after that, Paul's going to go and talk about the true meaning of Christmas. The format of the College of Complexes is as follows. We'll first have a brief announcements period, then we'll have our speakers speak, then we'll have a question and answer period, and after that question and answer period, we'll have the infamous rebuttal period, where we'll each get a chance to spout off for a little bit of time. Now. Let's get the announcements period started. Should you still celebrate Christmas if you're Jewish? Well, you have Hanukkah. It's part of the holiday season. Well, you said everybody should celebrate Christmas. Yeah. Right? No, no, no. He meant the universal Christmas. Yeah. 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 All right. I, I, I brought this tonight because I was afraid of, I might forget it next week, but here's a little something Thank you. from your pals. From the, Thank from you. The pals. This is a three-part presentation. Um, the first part, I'm going to look at basically some of the customs and traditions. I think Paul will cover some, most of that later. But basically, a look at some of the customs and traditions regarding the holidays, uh, whichever you want to call this. Uh, the second part is going to deal with the economics. And the third part is uh, I'm going to present some alternatives that you can pursue instead of uh, things uh, that I think uh, Tom or um, Paul's going to give the true meaning at Christmas. Uh, well, yeah, well, I got the true meaning. All right, let's see here. All right, first of all, they always say you got to define your terms. What's a holiday? Uh, it's a ritual that one feels compelled to participate in. These rituals define our society. Um, they, so, they foster social cohesion most of the time if they work right. Uh, and they involve the sacred and profane. Uh, and in particular, they impose various sorts of obligations on the individual. Now that could be in a variety of ways. Uh, but we'll see some of that. Okay, this is the fake news. Uh, that most of you believe the holiday is about, that there's a jolly guy uh, who's got a pleasant little operation, a factory, making toys for children up north, uh, if you buy into that. And then again, historically, of course, there's been uh, religious figures, uh, a bishop in the east uh, made a saint of the church, um, and this is to the basically the uh, European Santa, Santa Claus goes or a pretty modest guy. You don't see him there with too much stuff, but he kind of actually just walked house to house. Okay. Um, as far as I can tell, and you can go all over the place with this. You can even go back to Babylon and the Egyptians, but basically Santa Claus is. Uh, a figure from the legends of the North, uh, the Norse god. Oh, and you don't have to read all this, but this is amazing. Um, the god is, he's an elderly, jovial, friendly, heavy-built guy. He rides through, now his, his, he had a horse with eight, eight legs. Um, so you can see where you get the eight reindeer. Uh, the, the other guy, actually, um, uh, Thor had knees pulled by like these goats here, and amazingly, Cracker and Nasher. So you see, we were Clement Moore who wrote the poem on um, night before Christmas. Kind of got these ideas here, uh, rewarded good children, and basically, all things aside, 
if you want to see where Santa Claus comes from, I'm pretty much going to settle on this, this here, though it's undergone numerous transformations. Now, currently some of the things here, I don't know if I'm in particularly dying all of this, but in Europe, uh, Santa Claus is accompanied by some bad guys <laughs> who affect discipline on children. Uh, it's not just dispensing toys like we have here. Uh, he has, these guys follow him around and they they have rooms, actually wood thatches and they'll give you a little whip in there. Uh, so, um, now the other thing about uh, Santa Claus, I'm not going to dwell all day on this, um, the greatest configuration, and a lot of people don't know this one, uh, of course the illustrator uh, Thomas Nash for Harper's Weekly is attributed for coming up with the pictures of Santa Claus and giving him this uh, jolly figure uh, that led to the development of ideas of Santa Claus. But he actually was trying to make him into a good, a good robber baron, a good CEO, uh, which is where that came from. So that's, these are two illustrations by the same guy. And he's, okay. And of course, Coca-Cola got involved, as they do in a lot of things of our culture. Uh, I don't know particularly why, but they felt um, just fostered the use of their product. Now, it used to be that maybe you just went out with Grandpa and you got yourself a little tree. Uh, this is not a big deal. Uh, kind of nice little activity. I did this when I lived in the country, went off to the woods. You know, all the pioneers, they had little modest trees here, that all handmade, little decorations. And you might get one little toy or two that, that maybe your pa made for you or something like that. You know, that was no big deal here. Um, now the Victorians came along and it started growing and they started giving this some, some real substance here. Um, particularly with uh, in England with the crown and the Queen Victoria and her husband brought over the customs of the trees and so forth from Germany. Prince Albert. So uh, they, in the beginning of the 1840s, uh, really uh, um, developed the holiday itself. Before that, of course, it was outlawed, and even in the states and things like this. And a lot of people don't realize this: um, is that beginning in 1776. Technically, there were no holidays in the United States. So we started out brand new, and Christmas was not celebrated, um, largely because, and I know there's many ways of getting about this, and I'm not going to get into theology, but uh, they didn't like British things. And it was identified with the, the crown. And that's largely why uh, it was not practiced here. All right, now changing a totally different thing. I'm a transportation guy, and one thing that's relevant to the, certainly is uh, an indication of the holiday, is uh, the transportation, going home and visiting with family and uh, your family during the holiday. I'll give you some figures on this, so we can see here uh, with the development of the railroads uh, network across the United States, this certainly was possible. Uh, some of us don't have very much, so our travel is perhaps limited to the Christmas train on CTA. It's about all I can afford. But uh, the, um, now the other thing about visiting friends, uh, traveling, to visit, as I indicate there, 71%, most of the people in the, in the country should spend the holiday at home visiting with their relatives. And here we get an analysis of the holiday here. I mean, particularly if one of your relatives is a Nazi like this guy. <laughs> or this is this will be really good. This will, this will set things off. All you have to say is you could be so pretty if you if you only lost a little weight. 
Well, it's supposed to indicate you end up having family gatherings with people you don't agree with. So you, um, yeah. Uh, All right, thank you. Continuing the theme of transportation, uh, more than 170 million Americans, this is a French figure I just posted last week, are going to be traveling. So about a third of their nation uh, will be out and around uh, traveling for the holiday. I got nothing against that. It's kind of nice to see your relatives, you know. I know I got, going back to it, the holiday for many, many years was no big deal. Like here, you see a little stocking here. That was about it, you know. Um, here's one of the things about how it got commercialized. I had only heard about this, and I did mess around. I have been a librarian, so I mess around with children's books. And I heard about this book, The Elf on the Shelf. But then again, I, I heard it like this. I went to the website. They're selling this as the as, uh they're claiming it's already an established Christmas tradition. And no sooner do you go to the website than they just start scrolling. This is strictly to sell stuff. In particular, you got to buy one of the elves. I thought it'd just be a friendly little story book and might be interesting. There's all kinds of children's books written about the holiday and what goes on. My favorite series is one called Charlie. Charlie the Dog, uh, which is a nice series, and they bring home a little kitten. So Charlie got, he's got this kitten that he has to contend with. But it's a nice little series. But this one here, it's amazing how they sell, sell, sell. They jumped on this. Nothing, nothing is sacred to these guys to making money. Uh, they catch on this here. If the elf is supposed to hide at night. And keep an eye. It's a variation of something called the kitchen god in China. They have so this is not unique to this culture. And uh, many of them, they have a, a, someone who watches on the household and reports back, and whether the people are are good or bad. Okay. Uh, another aspect of the holiday that we could get rid of, and I read this. Uh, I somebody. This was an old thing. Uh, they were complaining about. Um, the how one reason uh, there was just uh, some ministers who wanted to get rid of the holiday because he said they people got drunk and particularly the unemployed and the unaccounted. That's what I said. You guys are the unaccounted one. Unaccounted. You're unaccounted. Well, look at this. Look at this young girl. Look at what's going on. Look at Santa here. <laughs> you bring your children to see this guy? Come on. All right. Another thing that's coming, now we're getting into the economics, is a thing called Christmas Creek, where it starts it started moving. You know, it wasn't bad. You know, we, we had a holiday on the day that it took place, but it expanded, of course, to Thanksgiving. It's going further, further back, and they're looking at Thanksgiving or, or Halloween now, if not earlier. But uh, that's the date where they're going to commence merchandising here. Of course, the department stores are largely behind the development of the situation uh, with their store windows, and of course, the Macy's Parade and other attendant celebrations like this. Um, actually, I was going to tell you, when I lived in New York, I lived where, where, at the park right where they blew up those balloons. So it was kind of interesting to watch. But um, anyhow, Macy's. And of course, you might remember uh, the displays in the department stores, the network we had on State Street downtown that would uh, do it. It's, merchandising is changing a little bit. And I think this is going to bring about some instant purchasing because it's convenient instant purchasing. But uh, right now, 34% of the shoppers say they plan to buy using uh, online or catalogs. So this is um, one way to avoid going shopping and perhaps even spending more because it, it's effortless. You're just pressing some keys. 
Okay, some of the things about the toy development we'll look at now. Uh, this basic stereotypes, of course, over the years. I got a few more things here, how toys reinforce existing stereotypes. Either that's, I don't know if that's necessarily good. Um, uh, one thing about the toy industry in the United States, uh, it largely, there, it doesn't exist. There's no toy industry in the United States, really. This is a, a, a thing of the model of the Lionel uh, factory that you could get for your layout. And this is an actual photograph that I ran across of the existing Lionel factory in Michigan. That's all that's left of it. And man, one of the amazing things is um, the collectors such as myself, we can't even ascertain where they're making them these days. Uh, Some place in China, that, that's as, as good as we can. I don't know why it's, why it's so difficult. But. Okay, and these are just some of the, um, actually, I, I'm a hobbyist, so I wanted to throw this in there and, and show you the, um, actually, the, the United States, when they want to, can produce worthwhile toys. Obviously, this had a very positive and beneficial effect upon me and led to me becoming one of the foremost experts on transportation in the United States today. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, we got a nice bridge bond in Brooklyn for you to buy, Charlie. There's other things. No, there's, there's certain protocols which, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you, this can cause friction and confrontation. Um, I, I myself see nothing wrong with buying your wife a new stove. I think it's a good idea, but she and I might not be real receptive to the not idea. When she wants to go on vacation. I think, I think cooking pots and pans and appliances are nice gifts, but you know, look at this girl. You know, she's going to tell this guy to get, what's wrong with getting a vacuum cleaner? You know, come on. You know. <laughs> Anyhow, another thing, we're talking about traditions and things imposed upon you was uh, just home decoration. Uh, I think I even call it realizing the American dream that you have a home and you have to decorate it. Recently, my sister was on my case uh, to decorate my place in Bridgeport. <laughs> so I had one, yeah, I did, and she said, yeah, I guess it's, a, you know, if you don't do so somehow, uh, your neighbors will do a little less in the eyes of your neighbors. Uh, but nevertheless, I've met my requirements, and I've got my lit wreaths up there. Oh, uh, just a few other things. Uh, regarding Christmas trees, since we're talking about decorations here, um, one of the things about the holiday, you can go out and get a real tree, but it's recommended that you get, um, they have eco trees now. I think they've got another term for it. Um, you've also got to be careful, now I don't know if there's many incidences of this, but you've got to be careful about Lyme disease. Uh, what you bring into your house, that may be just a little phobia here. But nevertheless, there are about 170 to 300 any house fires a year. And if you can see right here, this is not an accidental fire. These are some ne'er-do-well lefty protesters who set this Christmas display on the park on fire as a form of protest. What kind of hoodlums are these? We get no respect for Christmas here. And of course, these silver things. Um, my boss used to make me put one of these up our department. It was kind of embarrassing, but he refused to, to get a new tree for our department. All right, some stupid things I just came across. I don't know what this has to do with the holiday, but it's an indication. I don't know if we really need or require, you know, top of year we got Zillas, you know, for the decorated for the holiday here. Oh, this is the latest one. These inflatables they got out there now. But I came across one, you can get a whole bubble. And I was thinking of getting one and going inside there, like having a live display or something like that. But you can get a giant one. This is, this is uh, 
so you can open the door and get in. Now why this is a campaign issue, I have the slightest idea whatsoever, given the priorities and situation in the United States. We're threatened by nu nuclear hostile powers, but he's concerned about whether or not we all say Merry Christmas again. Like, who cares? <laughs> Honestly. Um, I'm, this is, I'm going to tread on your thing a little bit. Uh, I've actually seen this. This is in front of the Supreme Court building. Uh, the Christians are belly aching uh, because they they can't put up their religious scenes. You know, you know what belly aching is. You know, like oh, oh. but this is an ongoing issue here. Uh, now another thing is the extent that people go or 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 egregiously excessive in this. Christmas to him. And I see these things posted on the internet. Look at the piles of some of this stuff. This is just unbelievable. I mean, this is, I just wonder how many people is this for? It's probably like four people or something. I mean, look at this. Look, look at this. Piles here. I, what exactly do they need? I, um, anyhow, the holiday now extends from Thanksgiving through Cyber Monday, 174 million Americans will be shopping. Um, the most popular day was, was thus far was Black Friday, followed by you know, Small Business Saturday. And today, according to their predictions, will be the busiest day. It's like the stars just fell just right, and today is the busiest. Of course, Black Friday mania, this woman is kind of famous because she's desperate to get into her favorite big box realtor. And some of the ads you can no doubt get in your paper. Um, this is amazing here. Um, but you'll, most people will spend seven and a half days shopping each year, three and a half hours a week. Actually, they'll spend as much time shopping as they will with their family. Now, that maybe says something about their family. <laughs> now, I know my family would love to have me well in excess of 15 hours. Uh, a few little more data here. What are they spending it on? Large to, to be expected. Clothing about two thirds. Um, this is what people are going to be spending buying it on gift cards, um, toys, candy, electronics. Uh, most people are going to spend time with their family and friends, give or to open gifts. 50% uh, are going to have a special meal. Um, Forty half the people decorate their homes. Um, so this has really consumed everybody. Our society is certainly consumed by this holiday. And one third people are going to give to charity, which is commendable. I just threw this in. I, I don't quite got the money for it but I've been meaning to buy this hat so I could be like Comrade Lennon and walk around the neighborhood, you know. Uh, oh, okay, now I'm going to get into what's going on back there. Yeah, be the behind the scenes of this holiday, you got guys like this Jeff Brizos here and his Amazon operation. Um, his, he's on, he's given, trying to give Walmart uh, a run for the money, a picker in one of his outfits is expected to walk 11 miles per shift. And they're supposed to get a shipment every 33 seconds. And they got little monitors um, that keeps track of them, wherever they are in the facility. And if they, they're not working, they get a little buzz or something like that. You know, yeah. <laughs> Well, I like this here. It was 110 degrees. This is an episode I read about. And instead of giving them the afternoon off, they gave them cooling bandanas. Thanks, boss. Yeah, you're, that's capitalism for you. Oh, well, look at that's where you work. Um, oh, the other thing. Um, there's a thing up about you having union union elections here, but uh, this guy here, nothing about Amazon, they had one location in the West Coast, 
that they were going to get unionized. Amazon shut the thing down and laid off all the 400 employees. And uh, every year they have uh, classes that the employees are assembled on the clock and have to learn how, how bad union organized labor is. Um, so go buy stuff from that. I don't watch a lot of TV, but I do know these things on uh, infomercials are, are on there for various sorts of gadgets, like this bacon thing. Bacon mold, uh, I have seen that one. Uh, anyhow, making your turkey or chicken and, you know, what, 15 minutes, miraculous project. <laughs> they got the girl selling now the the new water makers or something like that. Here's some other, oh, this is what, this is what free market capitalism is providing us with. You know, this is why we need the holiday, because you can get the wake and bake dream griddle. Now, how this works precisely, I have no idea. I don't know, maybe you do it the night before. I like this one here, the knapsack. You can just put it. Why well, you can't just get a pillowcase? Yeah, you need a knapsack in it to take a nap. And this one, my cats would never settle for this. The pet petter, a little machine that <laughs> pets your cat. It's, a, it's relieving you of the tedious duty of having to pet your little cat. <laughs> oh, this one here. This is the latest one. The clean stride. You just put these things on and you can... Am I dead here? <laughs> it's a brush. <laughs> you can you clean it. No, they had a, look at they got a snow shovel version for the snow. Yeah, it's uh, the I know if they had a mop version, I might take them up on this. Oh, more facts and figures here. Uh, how much we're spending. Uh, actually, we're kind of shortchanging our co-workers here. We spend 500, 700 bucks on our relatives and friends. and We don't get much to co-workers. We give more to our pets than we give in gifts to our co-workers. <laughs> but, uh, all right, this is just some data here about the, the breakdown of the, the hierarchy in the industry, uh, the big box realtors versus the independents, um, shop small, um, one third of all retail establishments is amazing. One third of retail establishments have no paid employees. Uh, so they're not big operations. Uh, small things here. But uh, the large stores account for 75% of the sales. Okay. Oh, I just want to give you some of the marketing stuff that they will try to use on you. Uh, of course, this is strictly marketing. And no one would think this is disingenuous way of making money, but uh, some of the things they do, they offer one big bargain, <coughs> they'll hold an event. You really got to watch out for this thing. They still say email campaigns are very effective. They are. Surprising. And now this one's cool. proximity marketing. Use a, they have antennas so that if you're using your phone and you walk past the store, I guess it'll alert you like, hey, stop, go in, buy, you know, or something like this. Uh, they actually use charities, thinking, you know, they're good, uh, yeah, they're going to help out the world. Pre-wrap, oh, this is another one. Um, the gifts are already wrapped, so you just buy it and, and you're ready to go. Uh, these are for people who really got to got a schedule. I love this here. This is another thing they recommend for stoners. This is for store owners now. And they recommend that you get a massage therapist for your clerks so that they can keep, 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 keep going out there and buy, sell, 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 you know, and speed. All right. Another thing, uh, where, do we, where do we buy from Asia? Actually, the only thing I want to point out here, about one-fourth of the things we buy are toys. 
Yeah, if you get heard about these trumps, man, you can see where they get their stuff made. Made in China here. The vodka Trump footwear. Yeah, make America great again. Sure, Bill. Uh, it was about the intermodal containers you probably see on trains. Uh, the U.S. Um, imports 23,000. Um, and our exports are 13,000. So we're about a deficit here. I was wondering what we get from Mexico. We really don't have too many gifts or toys. But they do have things like Fisher Price factories down in Mexico. Uh, I won't get into Mattel. The Mattel has 100 suppliers in China. What they do is they tell you this is what we're going to pay, either make the price or not, or we, if you if you got to meet their price in order to get the contract. Um, but they dictate what they're going to pay. And Disney, Disney's been very cautious. They've been very, very cautious about uh, how their stuff is made. Nevertheless, they're, it's very difficult for anyone to get into these factories or discuss anything with these employees here. You can see here, these are some of the conditions. You, you uh, maybe get to uh, rest underneath your workstation. Uh, more of the industry here. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Plastics, all of this stuff is made out of plastic. And we're never more than three feet away from some plastic. The thing that I'll save you a lot of time on this is that most of the plastic they use to make these toys is the most dangerous to deal with or to handle for employees. You know, there, and there's no inherently safe plastic stuff. Let's put it that way. Um, but many of the additives that give certain items, certain properties, the marketplace demands are the very chemicals most likely to give leach off gases. Of course, the answer is toys. There's lists of these every year. A uh, few toys in the past to show you what free market capitalists will sell you for your child here uh, if you need to introduce them to the benefits of nuclear energy. <laughs> uh, you can get one for your son. They even, I actually had one of these, because I got the car for, I think I remember a dollar. And I said, what the heck, I didn't want it, but for a buck. Oh, there's some, these are toys right now. This is an indication where we're at. But you can get a, a nice game called, let's go to the factory. That should be fun. Hey kids, let's play, let's go to the factory. Line of Coke. <laughs> this one here, Mob Madness. The Coke Brothers. Every player gets gets a credit card and it makes a little sign sound to you. There's a sale on records. Line of and, Coke. <laughs> <laughs> and this one here, I don't know who would buy this. You can get your can their own little TSA set up. I don't know what kid would play with this. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course the Red Riders, which will shoot your eye out. You know, it's the introduction to weaponry. Oh yeah, the cops, yeah. We gotta get a, so they can grow up to shoot bad guys. Snub nose. So I like this one. You get an atom bomb, this is from the past, atom bomber. This one's still being sold. You get the cleaning trolley. Um, War on Terror game. Oh, and here's a hazmat cleanup toys. <laughs> and, uh, there is a good game out there called Strike, which you can play, I guess, you know. <laughs> oh, and the Christians here, anyhow, they, they also make toys for the religious community, and with this toy you can turn water into wine. Which is <laughs> glow in the dark hands it's got. A miracle toy, you know. Feed, feeds 5,000. Anyhow, one other last one here, just to make certain your daughter is a, a good shopper, you can introduce her to a bank machine here. Uh, this is Foxconn. And you know what other Foxconn is? Yeah, China. Do you own electronic equipment of any type? Yeah. Whatsoever is made by Foxconn. 
they force their people to put these time shirts on to show how happy they are to work there. I gave extensive talk on this. These are where they were jumping off uh, oh, committing suicide. Uh, the, no one's gotten into the factories, the ascertainments. They have installations with 400,000 employees, uh, all hired through a contractor, so there's a middleman. Foxconn is not responsible for what goes on in any of those factories. Only the, the hiring agency. This is what you run into. Might get a little break like this. Okay, now, did I have one more? Oh, that's it. Okay, a little bit about retailing. Began isolated in the country action news stores like this. But you used to have the country store uh, that have just about met all your material needs in terms of merchandising. Pretty basic there. Essential utilitarian items. Uh, it grew, of course, expanded, it grows here until you ended up with this kind of department store operations here. Here's the data on where the stores are right now. Walmart is really up there, over 5,000. Um, Costco is really not that big. Uh, but they are pulling in the money. This is the ranking by dollar volume of sales. So they're pulling it in. It's kind of amazing. CVS with, is the largest with about 10,000 uh, stores, but they're only seventh in dollar sales. Oh, here, just a little details about um, retail clerk salary, about 20000 Look at this lady. I love these pictures. And look at this guy. That's you people here complaining about your dinner here. Uh, just the issue about uh, Thanksgiving. The only thing I want to say is that we're the only country that doesn't, doesn't guarantee workers paid holidays. 25% uh, of the employees in the U.S. don't get paid holidays. 40 and about half of service workers don't. Uh, this is what happens to you, uh, particularly in retailing. Um, if you cause any trouble, you're likely to have hours cut. If they're just a little mad at you, or else uh, they might call immigration authorities on you. Uh, if they're really mad, you'll get fired. Uh, anyhow, the Americans also, what are we doing? I don't know what we're doing here to buy all this stuff here, but we're the hardest working people on earth. It, beyond any other country here. Uh, Walmart, of course, you know who this guy is, right? He's out there. Fair trade is a good way to go, particularly for items like chocolate. Uh, this began as a retail and got more into the fast food operations. Uh, most of the people are, in fact, not kids, but like, I like that commercial. What does McDonald's call it? the best first job or something? Yeah. yeah, it's not. It's not the first job. Oh, this is a girl who started kicking up sand, shot her mouth off at Burger King, so they disciplined her because she didn't put the pickles right. I don't blame them. I, I don't know how many times I've gotten one of these and the pickles were just put all over the place. What kind of, what kind of amber is that? You know, This is a little bit out of date. McDonald's gave up on this. They were giving uh, financial advice to their employees, such as uh, uh, take at least two vacations per year. Uh, what is it? They had the other one, like, oh, yeah, like return your gifts. If you get Christmas gifts, return them so you can live. Uh, various international labor organizations on this. Buy Nothing Day has been kicking around for years. Uh, I like this one here. I'm going to stop in a minute on here. Uh, what do you do if you don't have money? Can you still have a holiday? Yep. Now we're getting into the alternatives. Oh, yeah. yeah, these are some cool ideas. Mm -hmm. Just go for a drive. I used to do that when I lived in the country. Start a new tradition. Have a picnic under the tree. Limit your gifts to stockings only. Uh, make it a party. 
invite the neighbors. Not, not a bad idea to do. Go, all, I like this one here. Make it a rule that everyone must make each other's gifts. Now, I don't know what you guys would make to give me that I would want. <laughs> uh, splurge. Buy one gift for the whole family. It's another thing. Buy used. This is another strange one. Wrap every little gift. And I've heard, the, I heard a guy out talking about this. People just like this wrapping, opening gifts. So if you get like, I guess if you get like a chess set, wrap each of the chess pieces. <laughs> oh, treat the day special. Yeah, these are good ideas, actually. I like that. What can you do by skipping Christmas? Forget all this. No gifts, none of that. Go get some checking account. Can we get a bank account? You know? <coughs> um, I was going to talk about Eco Christmas. Um, you can look on the Chicago Green's website, and it gives you more detail on each of these. Uh, some of the regifting is okay. Uh, anyhow, I can skip over this. Lower the impact of decorations and alternatives here. Um, to reduce lighting displays. Uh, okay, and this is another thing regarding wrapping. A lot of you people may not know this. Avoid buying glossy foil or metallic wrapping paper. Uh, and use tape sparingly, or not at all. I don't know how you do that, but um, choose alternatives. Uh, here I'd say, there's somebody who's saying use our old CTA maps. There's a new sharing economy using the internet, which you can look up. I don't think about that. Uh, Sue, uh, Sue Shell spoke at the college a few years ago, not long, long ago. I still keep in touch with her. Please go out and buy union-made stuff. And last of all, my little story here about how the union takes no holiday. The Christmas was coming, and Santa was swamped with orders. I told all the else, you better get off your green ants and get to work. He told all the elves to join the union. His Santa said, I'll show you who runs the North Pole. He told them off, that's for sure. See what the elves are up to? Uh, Santa finally agreed to the elves, and everything was settled by Christmas time. It can be done, but anyhow. Happy holidays. Thank you very much. Okay. No. The Grinch. There's the Grinch right here. I'm wearing green. Give us the Grinch. All right. I'm fighting you over. Of course you did, Charlie. But that's that's part of your modus operandi. Tim, can you go back about ten slides? Why? There was a sign on the side of the road. I wanted to read the sign. It said it was like the target. target. There was a road sign, a historical marker sign I wanted to read. You know, actually, you know, people worked until midnight. Maybe about 20 slides. Yes. Oh, sure. Okay. I don't know what time they probably closed. I never thought that I would be saying this, but I like Christmas. And normally, this time of year, I'm so busy working 12 to 15 hour days that it gets to be a drag. And uh, my favorite part about Christmas is usually the Beavis and Butthead type. Oh, yeah, Christmas. <laughs> but anyway, I can get this thing to work here. Christmas actually was illegal in the U.S. until 1836, as it was considered an ancient pagan holiday. And, you know, so basically, Charlie was right about one thing. The Victorians came in, they wanted a holiday, and they got their holiday. Needless to say, in a lot of cases, though, sometimes people regret what they get. 
If you remember about 1904, some of you I'm sure can, there was a lady who wanted to celebrate a day for her mother. I'm forgetting her name, but she campaigned vigorously for Mother's Day to be recognized as an official holiday. She finally got to her holiday, the second Sunday of the month. And then, after she got her holiday, she got really upset at what people were doing with her holiday, turning it into a, a holiday's Mother's Day, and turning it into flowers and candy, and I just wanted a day that people would say it and spend it with their mom. I didn't think that it would turn into this marketing hassle. Later on, she got so out of it that uh, she was in a sanitarium. Well, that sanitarium was paid for by the flower industry because she could not afford the bills otherwise, and she did give them the marketing opportunity. And in many cases, Christmas has done just this. I, too, had uh, given a big spending breakdown like Charlie was going to do, and the rest of my presentation will consist of that with a little bit more of uh, some stuff by the end of me. But you can see there, that's basically what people do when they spend money these days. And specifically, Christmas time, the bottom line is the, act the top line is the actual dollar amount spent on Christmas, and the bottom line is the one that's adjusted for inflation. And as you can see, I think the high points were <coughs> right around the 90s and early 2000s before we had the Great Recession. But as you can see, it's starting to come back. I honestly think people like shopping. I honestly think people like Christmas. I think they like to take a little time off over their year and want to have the goodwill towards spending and things like this. As you can see, a total of 34% of holiday purchasers purchase their plans from catalogs and other direct marketers. And you know, you can often say, but in the latest data available, they plan to make about a thousand dollar, fourteen twenty-one dollars each year. I'll give you a reference to this survey a little later on. The average plan spending by those saying making purchases on the internet is about one thousand three hundred forty-six. Small four dollar increase from last year. But it's been consistent. They started uh, you know, 2007 when the Great Recession was here, they were still spending an average of $967. This one here is basically shoppers saying that they will pay full, you know, the behavior of, of, of sales and the behavior of what people will do to pay full, fr full price. And as you can see, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit more, you know, on the crazy side. You know, they, there's a lot of people who wait till stuff goes on sale. And, you know, the other thing, too, is that Christmas has bled over, but a lot of times I think it's the uh, sales that do this. You know, a lot of them, this was taken, the survey every year was taken about the third, second, third week in November, and they're asking shoppers, have you started your Christmas shopping early yet? Well. A lot of them have. And as you can see here, it's 48% in 2007, and in 2005, it was 59%. Even, even that, that trend has kind of actually gone down a little bit more because we have Amazon, we have the internet, we can get almost anything we want online almost instantly. And the survey that I just went over, is there's some data on it, it was from the American Research Group. Now, you see, I like Christmas. I like all the energy that's coming that's spent on Christmas. I like the excitement that people have about Christmas. Yes, even those cynical like about Christmas, like me, get excited over the year because we have a lot of good comedy relief. You see, I kind of look at it like this. If you can have a monstrosity like this crossing the expressway every day with their big LED TV lights, just 
to make a woman look good. And believe me, they make a lot of money in Rosemont off this mall. You know, it's about the same capacity as that building cost about an estimate, what the estimated cost for a thorium molten salt reactor would cost. I would much rather, we, we do this through private investment. It would be amazing if we could just take something like that, bring up the cheap nuclear power, and we could really celebrate Christmas. Of course, I had to say something. So Charlie and everybody else, should I vote with the Grinch? No. <laughs> okay. Merry Christmas, everybody. I gave you some stats. Now we're going to have Paul to talk about the true meaning of Christmas. Mr. Paul. I'm not against young women getting nice balls. But when they want to look nice, that's okay. I have some C's and greetings for you all, too. Merry Christmas and a hippo new year to everybody. <laughs> the re why do we celebrate Christmas? Traditionally, I mean, let's go. Let's go back. Where does Christmas come from? There you go. <laughs> well, the word Christmas breaks into two pieces: Christ and Mass. A Mass is a celebration. So Christmas is a celebration of the coming of Christ. Um, those of you who've been here with me before know I'm a devout Christian. And some things that uh, people complain to us Christians about with Christmas. Well, Christmas was based on a Druidic holiday. From my research, I found the, Catholic, the Roman Church put Christmas on the 25th, which was a Druidic holiday, to get people away from worshiping the Druidic holiday. To try and replace it. Do you have a spoon? And um, it's a known fact that Chris, Chris, Jesus could not have been born on December 25th, because on December 25th in Israel, the shepherds would not be out watching their flocks by night, or they would be frozen solid. That's a Mithra story. That's not Jesus' story. Heather. Question later. Yeah, no. But the, the, actual, the actual date of the holiday you know, putting it on top of a Druidic holiday is not important. The important part is the gift, God's gift to us. And that is why people started giving gifts in response to what God gave us. And as sinful men, we've blown it all out of proportion, gotten away from the original meaning, what Christmas is truly supposed to be, and made it into something very secular. I'd like to take a look at the word Christmas a little closer. Like I said, Christ and Mass. Today's society wants to take Christ out of Christmas. What do you get if you take Christ out of Christmas? You get Mass, which is Spanish for more. Masi, masi, mas. More and more and more. And that's what we have for Christmas today because Christ has been taken out of Christmas. He's a socialist. Here's a nod to the atheists out there. The reason for this season is because of axial tilt. Axial tilt. No, well, the reason for the season of winter is because of axial tilt. It has nothing to do with Christmas. <laughs> and the real reason for Christmas is that God gave us a gift. And we, as uh, 
um, in response to the gift that God gave us, we give gifts to others. Thank you. Okay, and that's all right. Questions? Charlie and Paul, why don't you stay up unless you want to run the camera, Paul? Okay. All right. Let's go to get. Let's go to questions. Charlie, you ready to come up? I want to ask him a question. Okay, go ahead. He's going to be around. All right. I don't know how to make this a question. December 25th was given as the birthday of Mithra, who was in the, born in the Middle East out of Iraq, and, were, and there were shepherds. It had nothing to do with Jesus. They took the story of Mithra and made it Jesus. It's not Jesus' story. And, uh, so that to say that Jesus, it tells us nothing about when Jesus was born because it, the story is about Mithra. Well, I can also and you told a story about Jesus and shepherds. That had nothing to do. They stole that story from the Mithras. As I said before, the exact date doesn't matter. The exact place doesn't matter. Whether there's similar stories doesn't matter. It's the fact the gift was given and that's what's important. The okay, another question. The, the story of the birth of Jesus was was put inserted in the scriptures in order to win arguments about the nature of Jesus. That's where they that's why they were appended. What other explanation could be given for their insertion later than the other four Gospels? They're, Why were they inserted later? It's in the Gospels. It wasn't. Yes, it was, came along later. Well, yeah. I don't know about that. So. <coughs> okay. Let's get in. A, okay. I've never heard of that. Yeah. All right. Next guy. Who wants to uh, pick somebody, Paul? He's, he's right here. I, like you said, nobody knows when he was born, right? He was born four years before himself. He was born four years before himself. Oh, come on. Due to a clerical error, they they due to a clerical error in the, around 1,000 or so, when they first started trying to estimate the date, they placed zero zero A.D four years late after they recalculated. So Jesus was born four years before himself. Uh, why did they pick up uh, the, uh, December? The 25th. Uh, do you have any idea? What I've heard is the Roman church picked December 25th, which was a Druidic holiday, to get people away from the Druidic holiday. Okay, now. So there is something pagan about it, right? Yeah, but it, it doesn't matter. Okay, now. I mean, Easter, I've heard that Easter is the same thing. Easter is yeah. pagan Robert holiday. That's not a Jewish holiday. Huh. I said a pagan holiday. Yeah. All right. All right, let's uh, get our next what, resident cynic. What proof is there that there was a Jesus? Definitive proof. Thousands of eyewitnesses. Oh, okay. Name one. I can answer that. I can name yeah. twelve. Jesus is a what? composite of about eighteen different individuals. Eighteen? Yes, and the only the only historical documentation there is are the Gospels themselves. There's no other. The the uh, Jewish historian Josephus. No, that's <laughs> that can <laughs> work. Familiar. The no. Jewish historian Josephus records the apostles no. after Jesus. No, there's nothing. Oh, Charlie, that's a forgery. Tangible. I'll give you something tangible in a minute. I'll tell you what. Take a look at the works of Ivan Panin, a mathematician around 1890 who found a consistent mathematical congruency in the 66 books of the Holy Bible. I won't get into it too much now, but if you delve into his work and you Google him, you're going to find the proof that you need for a plenary explanation for the verbal inspiration of scriptures. 
There. Oh, yeah. Forget about the Kamala. A secret message. There's a secret code in the Bible. That's because you're too dumb to understand it, Charlie. I believe this is back in the 90s or 80s. There's no secret code. A judge who is an expert on evidence was given the evidence for Jesus and his resurrection. And he said there's more than enough evidence to prove it. Josh McDowell, oh, evidence some demands. Some so-called judge? No. Uh, a judge, <laughs> like a, no, like a judge, like in a t courtroom. Okay. How about in the America? Guy, how about the guy the, who was in college? <laughs> what so are we talking judge. about? This. We All right, let's yeah, go. Next the, question. Uh, wait a minute. The, the scriptures were not written down. The earliest, <laughs> eighty years after Jesus passed away, upward to four hundred years. So how accurate could that be? I mean, some people, and there are theologians, I forget his name, the well-known one, said, and I spent many years, with a great, uh, the minister that came here, what was his name? Um, Usher? No, uh, you know the minister. Uh, and I when, said he'd read for years, and the conclusion is, is just faith, if you wish. Leave don't, home. Leave. don't go looking for this circle, Jesus. You're not going to find it. All right. Next question. Who, who gets close, Paul? Well, as, yeah, Peter, as, as, just one, one more thing on that quick. As archaeologists are digging deeper and deeper yeah. in Jerusalem and other areas in Israel, they are finding more and more and more evidence that supports what is in the Bible as a history book. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Which one? Well, go Jonathan. Yeah. Who's, I yield to Pat out of respect. All right, well, Pat. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the, Romans, the Romans, out of necessity, were great record keepers. And, of course, at that time, Judea was under Roman occupation. Have any records been found there we go. of the trial and crucifixion of one Jesus of Nazareth? I have not heard of any, but I don't. I, I, I haven't really researched it. Speech it. No, it doesn't exist. Look that up. Yeah. They did. They did find record that uh, about the time of Jesus' birth, Quirinius was governor of Syria. Okay. But that wouldn't have anything to do with. My question here. No. Some, some <coughs> that uh, there is more evidence uh, for the existence of Jesus than of Julius Caesar. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with that? There, there is, there is one. I, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Like, like I've said before, some I'm not a biblical scholar. <coughs> I'm just Julius Caesar is a myth. He's yeah. <laughs> emperor. One thing the Romans did do they for the Christian church is no, a lot of the that. holy sites the, where Jesus was born, Nazareth, where Jesus lived, the tomb where Jesus was buried, they defaced them and marked them up because they thought, well, we'll stop these people by ruining their holy sites. But that made it all the easier for people in our time and later times to find them again. Okay. All right, Jonathan. Charlie, uh, <coughs> Tim, yes. and Paul, great job as always. Uh, Charlie, I liked a lot what you said about making a gift and giving someone something that's real personal, like a poem or a song or something that you sewed or. <coughs> uh, I think about uh, communities of poverty who. Uh, in my estimation throughout history have uh, lived that ethos more than any community where uh, communities of poverty, especially in the global south, they can easily be violently angry towards the wealthy nations and yet show this magnanimous peacefulness throughout the year, not just at holiday times. If we are such a, in the West, <coughs> such a peace on earth, goodwill towards all ethos, people, and societies, is it not only right if we, as you stated, your deep faith in peace on earth, goodwill towards all, ambassador of history, cancel all debt, especially for the global south, yeah. and also <coughs> start the conversation about 
justice so economically, what's your, which is reparations for the poor. So what's your question? Uh, reparations and canceling debt for the poor of Earth as a sign that we actually practice what we preach as far as peace on Earth, goodwill towards Wall Street. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about. And the reason I mentioned that, Charlie said, make your own gift. Well, that's sort of making the thing your own is you gift. Gotta, you have to remember something. There was a year of Jubilee proclaimed in the Bible. Yes, there Every was. 70 years that uh, oh. all debts would be canceled. Every got something big enough to do. No, it's not in there. It's called the year of Jubilee. And every 70 years, all Seven debts years. would be canceled. Okay. Uh, what? Seven years. So, oh, every, Paul's reminding me every seven years. We gotta, yeah, we got to Okay. Okay, so that would eliminate a lot of your uh, <coughs> loans and interest of loans and yeah, stuff like that to uh, keep the uh, capitalists from becoming super valuable rich. It's already up. Uh, because <laughs> our cup's running over. They don't even have a cup. Why not? I mean, it, it would make everybody feel great that we were all on the same page, well, economically. You know, the thing is, is that uh, the holiday, I think, does bring that into it. I, you know, most everybody, what I see is that we like celebrating a holiday. We have an abundance in the United States. A lot of them don't. It's one of the few times a year that people get really, um, altruistic and, and try to live out their values. I don't know why we don't do that the rest of the year, you know, whether we're just so busy with work and society or whatnot, or we just don't give a hoot. But my Christian faith also says that men are sinners and in need of a savior. And that means there is a proclivity for mankind to be evil and to be more self-centered than normal. And that that proclivity for evilness can only be cured through uh, the one sacrifice that God made, and that was the death of his own son, Jesus Christ. You accept him as Lord and Savior, you go to heaven. I can't think of a better deal than that. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to do anything to, to get it. You just ask him into your heart. Now, if it's a bunch of BS, I can tell you my own life has been severely impacted by this profession of faith. And a long, maybe 20-year quest to see if this stuff is actually real or not. My own conclusion says it is. And I can tell you a lot more about it, but I don't think we want to get into the proof of Christianity tonight. What we're trying to talk about a lot of times is why there is a reason for the season. And it doesn't surprise me that men become bitter, they get crazy, that their own self-interest goes, and that if there's not some kind of limiting or governing force on the passions of men, it can really make the world an evil place. Yeah, they even you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying, Charlie, you got something to say on the Well, I got a question for you. You say right. All right, hey, Charlie. If this Christian, Christian ethos, if you wish, uh, is so wonderful, then. Why was it renounced in Alabama? Why would it we, most people re responded with shock and horror out of a good Christian. The thing is, I mean, Charlie, what he was saying, is that what you believe? Uh, to a certain that degree. That Muslims uh, are... Oh, well, Charlie, to be uh, honest with you, if I'm uh, Blacks and that and gays are this, that's what you're embracing? Charlie, when you're gay, I think it's more of a choice you make rather than the gender you are. And this is going to be very controversial. I do not have a, yes it is, as well as alcoholism, as well as gluttony, as well as a lot of other things. Um, my own views is that I've got some good friends who are openly gay. I don't condemn them. God might, but it's more, I believe, of a choice. If you're black, you're black. You're born that way. And if you get discriminated against because you're black, you're there. When you're gay, I don't. It's a hard passion to do it. But it is, I think, a choice you make, whether you want to or not with your own sexuality. You know, men have got certain drives. Women have got certain drives. But even in the scripture, it's like when sin gets more going, men will start lusting after one another. You can look at it in Romans. Um, I know that if everybody looks at the, the Gospels or the Scripture, you're going to find that the law that God gives 
is very harsh and it's designed to do one thing, to get you to have your awareness that you are wrong with the Holy God and that that whole law is designed to condemn you into seeing that you need a savior and that you can't earn it on your own and that you can't do anything on your own but you need a sacrifice to save you to save you can't earn your way to god or you can't earn your way to heaven jesus is the only way that the christians believe it's done yes this is a wall stone where he was on birth and she uh, who else has a question here? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, Charlie <coughs> doesn't want Christ to exist because he said he didn't exist because he doesn't want him to exist. What about are there these tens of thousands of martyrs? A martyr and a witness is the same word. These witnesses of Christ and the martyrs. Tens of thousands of okay. killed. Well, the Muslim martyrs and Is this our question? What's that? All right. I'm going to make a quick question? comment. All right. The question is. Um, what about these tens of thousands of martyrs? For, for, they didn't die for a myth. They died for a fact. Well, I, I believe Christ is not is no myth. And there are 48 uh, okay. prophecies in, in the Old Testament about Christ. And they all came true. There was 48 uh, prophecies. Now, if you had 48 coins, okay. well, we'll you, see, you flip the 48 coins up, what are the chances that all of them would come up heads? We'll save this for the return the true. period. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, we got to get to this. All right, Charlie, come on up and answer the question. Yeah, yeah, you're getting into some areas here. Religion is based on revelation. <laughs> and it's not, it's not verified. It's, it's, it's truth by revelation. And a guy says, I have a revelation, and he shares it with everyone else. And then very often he'll write, he'll write them down. But that's the difficulty. There's no yardstick between one faith and another. There's no tested measurements. There's no, and, and you say, well, you were inspired, and we just heard somebody here is inspired. But you can easily give a counter position, yes. and it's equally valid. And that's where you're at. And you get no place on this. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that I was leading to is, regarding Christian ethics, I used to think it was a good thing that people went once a week and got some sort of ethics. Yeah. But unfortunately, and the point I was making is, I began looking at the kind of ethics that they are receiving from the clergy, the priestly class. And some of them are, quite frankly, hypocrites. Nuts. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I began to say, this is not universally, as you would like to think, beneficial because the message can be widely distorted yes, of course it by can. complete crackpots. By in fact, you can get the get completely wrong message, such as this guy down there was talking about blacks and minorities and everything else. He got it all backwards. And to say, well, this is the same faith, you know, I'm sorry, that doesn't speak very well. And okay. You know, I'm, no, and I'm going to give you the simple version. All right, I'll take Paul, it. Let's go. Let, let, let him talk. I'm Sorry, boy, Paul. Yeah, defender of the faith. <laughs> as far as ethics goes, and preachers and such, any any movement, be it religious or otherwise, will have factions that spread well, off of in the wrong direction. We'll have people that take things the wrong <coughs> way. And in, re in religion, we know one thing. We're all sinners. None of us is perfect. And we're going to mess up. Unfortunately, you know, we get these high-profile people that are going the wrong way. They're claiming to be Christians when they really aren't. And it, it gives a black eye to the whole thing. Uh, you're, you're I'll take care of Paul's feet. Yes. You okay. are. Yes. And they're not... I can't say All right. for sure, but by, you know, by what they do and what they preach, I, I can say they're probably not because they don't follow what's in the Bible.
Did you have something you wanted to add to? Um, as soon as I uh, take care of this <coughs> bill what before. Uh, so it's not going to all right. And that's very good. All right. I now. I'm not God. I don't judge. Uh oh. All right. Um, wait a minute. Can I just add one thing? Go ahead, Chuck. He was talking there about fulfilling prophecy. And that's one thing I was talking about with him. When they. There were arguments in the early church about the nature of Jesus. Was he a God? Was he a man? Was he a spirit? Was he this? And everybody had kind of like a dispute. They're all valid at the time. But then they came up with a story like there were certain said, well, if he was God, there were prophecies in the Old Testament. And did Jesus fulfill the prophecies? One of the things are, was he, was he of the house of David? meaning like royalty. Um, they would prophesize that there would be celestial events, like the star. Uh, there were other prophecies. I don't know them all. So they took the stories, what they thought, perhaps even genuinely, were the stories of Jesus' birth and put them in two, two of the Gospels. But it was largely to win an argument. Like he was saying, prophecies here. They said, and therefore Jesus was fulfilling prophecies, and therefore he is God, and so forth. So it's, they had prophecies, and that's what I mean. They wrote the version then that said, well, he fulfilled the prophecies. You know, they won the argument. So that's why even the stories of the birth uh, are not objectively written. They're written with a purpose in mind. You know, that this is, there was a reason yeah, those stories are in there. Right. Everything that's in there about the stars and the, and the Magi and all this is in there for a reason. What's the reason? To win, to, to their arguments and disputes. You know, I, I, I often want to do it like this. As it says in the end of Ecclesiastes, and this is the end of the matter and this is the truth of all things. Much, much study wearies the body, here is the end of the matter and the conclusion of all things. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the sum of the existence of mankind. The Gospels and Christianity is a very easy religion to understand. You did wrong in the light of God's standards. He sent a son down for your place uh, because as, as sinners, the wages of sin and death, and we're heading to hell if we don't accept it. Now, with that said, yeah, I either. with that said, um, you accept Christ into your heart and you get a relationship with God started and all of a sudden your life will change. It did with me. It gave me a lot more patience and a lot more things. And second of all, you'll get a little bit more peace in your own life when you bring God in. Paul, you got anything more to add or Charlie, anything more to add? Uh, more questions? Or do you want to get better questions? Yeah, enough Christianity. All right. Yeah. I got a question Charlie. for Charlie. Yeah. All right. Hey, Charlie, what did that road sign say, the historic marker? That we'll pull it up for you before we leave. You already put all that stuff away. Yeah, we can. What did it say? Up it said this was the spot. Said, pull it up. Pull, pull, pull up on Charlie's computer. No, I just said on the site, destroyed. used to be a store. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, Charlie, do you know so this is where a big box store destroyed something. Where a big box store destroyed something. Charles, excuse me, I'm talking about Charles Dickens started the, um, right. the Charles Dickens started the Christmas edition of the Big Holiday with Stardust. the Big Holiday with his uh, Christmas tree and all that. Charles Dickens was the author of the Big Holiday with his Christmas carol and English speaking countries. But when did they start the dumb tradition of giving presents? Because it's sheer material. Juvenilia. Oh no. Yeah, the wrong Well, after, it was after, way after Jesus. No, yeah, it was, I'm asking you know, the question, why was, the question yeah, was, I'm why, did, this, why did the tradition people, of giving presents start at Christmas time? Presents? Wait a minute, come when, again. When did we start giving presents? It's a stupid tradition. Yeah, I go over uh, well. the It comes green in the capitalist country, that's all it is. All right. So, you know, nothing more. During when the did that start? The rebuttal, we'll give it to her about it. You've got one last question. 
Who, me? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I was only going to uh, uh, ask if the uh, custom of giving gifts was not a carryover from the Roman feast of Saturnalia when gifts were given and the church decided early on this is a good way to get people on the program. Uh, let's uh, adopt this as part of uh, our Christmas celebration and move the month from April, which is when it probably occurred, uh, to the last of December, okay. which was when the pagans had Saturnalia. You have got me stumped, and I don't know a thing about what you're talking about. Oh, my God. So, with that, we're going to start the uh, rebuttals. Let Andy go first. How does the okay? Uh, let me have a show of hands tonight. How many people think want to give a rebuttal? One, two, three, four. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I, I, we'll go I, four minutes like we usually do. You can't give a rebuttal. Here. I know I'm a speaker. I forgot about it. You can re you can rebut afterwards. Yeah, I know. Okay. We can re rebut. All right. So, we'll Mister, the the on deck circle for rebuttals is right over there by the rail. John okay. Will be next after me. Uh, I'd like to make uh, three quick observations. Hold on one sec. All right. Bertrand Russell, the English philosopher, wrote a book. Oh, had to be back around 1920 or 1930 called Why I Am Not a Christian. And he was not an atheist. He was an agnostic. And he was in, in prison briefly uh, for being a pacifist during World War I. And they asked him what religion. And he said, well, I'm agnostic. And they said, oh, well, they all believe in the same God. <laughs> Russell uh, uh, was um, famous for mathematics early in his career. And he said, mathematically speaking, if you, if you took 50 of the world's great religions, they all believe some, some different text or sect um, or, you know, uh, what, what do you call it, a different philosophy, more or less, they get 50 of the world's top religions in one room, and you can tell them, mathematically speaking, you all think you have the one true way to God. Well, I can tell you, since you're all different, one of you may be right, but the other 49 are wrong, and we don't know which one might be right. So he reserved judgment, number one. Number two, there's a website you can log on to called Zeitgeist. And in that website, there are, there are uh, educational videos. And one of the videos, uh, the early, of, I think from 2007 or 8, it's about a 90-minute video. And it shows the history of religion and the template uh, of, uh, you know, like Jesus dying on Friday and be, uh, rising again on Sunday. That corresponds with the longest day of the year when the sun begins to rise again on December 25th. That template has been used by, it was like 13 or 14 other religions going back in time before Jesus. It's not a unique story at all. Number three, and what we're seeing today is so relevant to understand, uh, the Christians in America are divided into roughly, they're basically two categories. You're pro-Christ Christians who believe in the teachings of Jesus, and you're anti-Christ Christians who believe you steal from the poor, you don't help the sick, you let them die. Uh, the, and many of those anti-Christ Christians are occupying seats in the current Republican Party. <laughs> There's a few of them in the Democratic Party, but you look, Jim Hightower published a book in 2003 called Thieves in High Places, and he had uh, about five pages of bills uh, what the Bush administration passed in the first two years, the Bush and Cheney. He said, number one, wade into this toxic sludge, put on your hip waders and rubber gloves and a gas mask and wade into this mess. See if you, see if you can find anything in there that helps the American people. And he said, now, once you wade through that toxic waste and come up for air, ask yourself this question. Why are there so many sex scandals in the Republican Party? Not the Democratic Party so much. Why are there sex scandals in the Republican Party? It always seems to be like Republicans. Well, he said, look at these bills they passed. To pass that kind of legislation that harms and kills people everywhere, to pass that kind of legislation, you need perverts. Or
ordinary people with a pulse and a conscience won't go anywhere near that kind of stuff. Since 2000, the Republican Party has been quietly weeding out through the primary process of running somebody in a primary. The Republican Party in this country has been weeding out anybody that has ethics, morals, or a conscience as those traits are properly understood. That's why you... I'll finish this. That, that, that's why today we have Republicans moving in lockstep to get rid of Medicare, Medicaid. They want to kill the internet, net neutrality, so that we don't have access to information about what these criminals are doing. Right now our country is being run by a group of corporate rich billionaire criminals unlike anything that's been seen since the robber baron years. And that's why there's a website, uh, you know, hashtag not normal. There's groups saying uh, it's not normal to accept Trump as the president because he's not the president. He's a corporate criminal sitting illegally squatting in the Oval Office masquerading as our president. And until we do something about that, we're not going to get our country back. The same thing I said earlier, until we publicly, all of us, disavow the myth of 9-11 and start taking our country back from the criminals that are all over the Middle East with a military industrial complex, we're going to continue to slide downhill. So uh, the website that give you good news every day is Common Dreams. Log on to that site. It's, a, it's the best progressive news site on the planet that I know of without all the junk food news and everything else. So there's all kinds of good stories about the good things people That's are doing. All lefties, Thank you. Lefty lies. It's not lefty lies, Charlie. I won't put up with that shit anymore. This is Christmas. <laughs> Merry complexes to Charlie and Tim. Charlie. That's it, huh? Although you're not a capitalist. <laughs> oh, thank you. Tim, I don't know where you are, but I got your green one for a thorium, so. <laughs> that doesn't cut into my time. Okay, uh, the one time in the Bible, the book that I've read from front to back, because I had to, uh, I'm a Unitarian Universalist, I'm a person of faith also, but I'm a secular <laughs> Uh, person of faith, and uh, I didn't hear anything I necessarily disagree with Paul and Tim. I just want to establish a very secularist view of the life of Jesus Christ. The one time in the book, uh, uh, the Bible, in John chapter 2, verses 14 and 16, where Jesus gets furious, is when he casts the money changers out of the temple. So I suggest everybody, whether you're a person of faith or an agnostic or an atheist or an undecided, to read that chapter because. Uh, those of us who thirst for justice on planet Earth, for those who work and the poor, love that. Uh, if the story is accurate of what people say when they looked into the sky, uh, the stars placing uh, December 25th or February 7th, I don't really care about that. The exact date is irrelevant to me. He seems like a very cool equalityist, a very cool civilizationist, a very cool peace on earthist, a very cool democratic socialist, a very cool we the peopleist, a very cool common senseist to me. Um, we don't realize our own purchasing power at holiday time in the United States. If every single American said we're not going to give corporate cartel our hard-earned money, uh, we would see uh, reaction from them that would give us leverage. It's one of the easiest things to do. Don't spend your dollar at holiday time. Make the corporations have to either surrender their charter because they violated basic human standards of decency and or domestic or international laws, uh, etc. We've seen what happens during the civil rights movement, the abolitionist movement, the suffragist movement when just uh, a small group of dedicated, uh, uh, resolute people show up. If everybody showed up, I would love to see that this holiday time. It's not likely. We're right across the street from a Target. So it's difficult to get away from these big docks companies. Uh, in American Notes by Charles Dickens, who wrote the famous uh, uh, Christmas Carol, uh, he, he writes about Washington, D.C. in Chapter 8. I don't have time in my rebuttal to read it, but I brought the book for the after party. Anybody would like me to read one page from Chapter 8. Uh, he talks about Washington, D.C. was just as rotten back then when he came to the United States as it is now. 
And the reason is, is the people don't have the will to say no. So that's all we have to do is just gain our strength to say no. Uh, Charlie and Tim, both of you are the absolute opposite of grandstanding millionaires in Washington, D.C., and I've considered this last year the best college of complexes year I've had the pleasure to attend or watch right. online. Yeah. Uh, you guys keep freedom of speech alive. Which is the most essential gift you could give anybody yep. is a sense that their ideas are respected and matter because that is why human beings are still here on earth because we're not robots and we're not cash registers and we're not bank accounts. We're living, breathing human beings who care and love, love each other. So thank you to both of you for your work this last year. Uh, to finish my rebuttal, I'd like to read a brief uh, excerpt from the movie from 1938, directed by Frank Capra, You Can't Take It yeah. With You, starring Gene Arthur and James Stewart. <laughs> Alice, placed by Gene Arthur, and Tony, placed by yeah. J James Stewart in the 49th, 50th, and no, I know everybody knows that I planned this on purpose, the 51st minute, it just happens to be in the 51st minute, the uh, park bench conversation scene. Well, Mr. Moody, what are you thinking about? Me, that family of yours, boy, they knocked me for a loop. I don't know, it just seems like in their own way they found what everybody's looking for. People spend their whole lives building castles in the air and then nothing ever comes of them. I wonder why that is. Well, it takes courage. Everybody's afraid to live. And then Alice says to Tony, you ought to hear Grandpa on that subject. You know, he says most people nowadays are run by fear. Fear of what they eat, fear of what they drink, fear of their jobs, their future, fear of their health. They're scared to save money and scared to spend it. You know what his pet aversion is? The people who commercialize on fear, you know? They scare you to death so you can sell you something you don't need. And then Tony says, yeah, I agree with Grandpa on that. So he kind of taught all of us not to be afraid of anything and, not, and just to do what we want to do. And, well, it's kind of fun anyway. Yeah, well, that's it. But that takes courage, especially that do what you want to do department. Everybody at the College of Complexes, thank you for teaching us all in this last year to not be afraid and to do what we want to do. All right. Next. You're up, Raj. You're up, Raj. What do you think they should have done for the guy that lost the money? <laughs> <laughs> How about you? My name is Raj Patel. The good man of faith of any religion or any calling. They think good ideas, good, good thoughts. They speak good thoughts. And they spread love and respect. And do not judge. <laughs> judge they not. I think Bible says that. That's not your judge. Okay? judge. I, I was in a philosophy class. The 500 students, all Christians, except me. And a professor asked, how many of you believe that uh, ideas in the Bible, ethics in the Bible, you advise everybody to practice, and they are practicable? And only one person said, that is true, it's me. So that, that tells about lots of believers, what they really think in their practical life. I'm going to drop some of, some of the, my experiences during Christmas. One time on a Christmas, day before Christmas Eve, I was stuck at a Lake Tahoe, Reno to Lake Tahoe. I was trying to hitchhike. And temperature was going to fall to zero degree, and I did not know. And Miracle happened, and I did not request any God to help me. Still, miracle happened. And uh, some man driving riverside, he said, come on, I'll, uh, you know, I'll help you out. He took me, he, and I was freezing. He took me to the restaurant and uh, bought me food. And then he was a very rich man. He was a wholesale liquor dealer. He asked his assistant to take me to his home. Next morning, get up, he asked his assistant to drive me to Lake Tahoe. Then go to 11,000 feet high, and then dropping me to 5,000 feet, see? So, I mean, I think I'm chosen one. The, 
I just stored it at Lexington Avenue in New York City on a Christmas Eve. And uh, when all the store closed, I said, let's stay open for half an hour more. And do you know what, what time I closed? Three o'clock in the morning. Customers kept on coming throughout the night. Finally, cops came in and said, look, it's too late. Nobody else is there, so close the store. So we closed. The, and uh, I don't know you, you guys have ever done it or not. When I was just in student <coughs> government, on a Christmas Eve, we went choral, choral, what do you call it? What do you call it? singing? Caroling. Caroling. Yeah, so, so we, we went singing there. So I mean, that is a probably a rare, rare experience for a guy like me to have it. Uh, in a digital business, we work very, very hard to make Christmas for lots of people. We start working in January for next year's Christmas. And it takes lots and lots of work, lots and lots of work in IJSON. And then during the last month, during the Christmas, December month, you, you at the end of the time, you pull like pulling your hair because you are so stressed out. And do you know something? Everybody, no matter you love or hate them, all these every business people do it, you know. And and I, I think it is a good thing, and people should appreciate that. Other thing I want to say is this: that respect all religion and respect their holidays, because that's a time for relatives to get together, friends to get together. There are things to say that I love you or not. And it is good no matter what religion and, and whatever it is. And I support that, you know. Either it's a Christian or Hindu or Muslims or Jew, you know, it's a pleasure, you know. A pleasure to have them that particular religion. Other thing, other thing I want to say is that, that uh, particularly we are all, not, you are all Christians here probably, and some Jew probably. Uh, look, the, the gay issue, it's for me to don't trade on me. Right. It is none of your goddamn business unless you are perfect. You open the Bible and you say that you're practicing every good thing in that. Don't pick on it, okay? If you did not, if you did not come out and we can believe that I'm, I believe everything about it. And do you know something? One thing Bible says: love your enemy. That's right. You know, respect everybody. It, 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 so you can, unless you are doing that, unless you are practicing every single thing in the Bible and you are not a sinner, don't care on other people. You know, it's so the pathetic short, shortness of your culture, of your value, of your person, and it is a bad thing to say to other people because I know, I, I had a friend who came one day crying. One second, I'm sorry, you're kidding me. Uh, five days before Christmas, he had an AIDS. He was recognized with the AIDS a recruit, 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 age, month before. He was working in a department store downtown. And he used to get lots of gifts for them. He had about all the gifts. And then he told his mother that, Mother, I have a diagnosis now with AIDS now. It's a serious thing. Do you know what his mother, mother called up next day and said to him? Please don't come. Because we go to church and we don't want everybody to know. Now this is the Christian thing. The mother saying his son, her son, not to come and say mail, mail me the mail us our gifts, but don't come. That is sadness. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think it was a reasonably good evening. Uh, it was entertaining in some respects. So we uh, learned some things uh, and. Um, um, unfortunately, it did devolve into the uh, Christianity thing. I think we have to try and reach a middle ground with this, and um, I think it isn't bad to um, have certain times of the year where we uh, recognize historical figures, and uh, if they were noble, uh, that the, uh, we uh, uh, learn something or that we uh, try to emulate uh, what they said or did. So. Uh, just as we have a day uh, set aside for Martin Luther King, 
uh, to remember and appreciate uh, the uh, uh, wonderful things that he did uh, to uh, uh, inspire uh, tolerance and equality and uh, uh, human rights uh, of all people uh, so we could respect and admire uh, some of the things that are attributed to what Jesus did and, uh, and taught. Uh, so that being said, however, we are under a cloud in this country and uh, this is not a normal Christmas. Uh, we wish that it was, but uh, as has been brought up by uh, many of the contributors here, uh, we are aware that we are under threat um, of um, uh, all free thinking peoples uh, that uh, do want to respect the rights of others and uh, maintain their own human rights uh, are under threat. And um, so uh, that is why I am a member of Refuse Fascism, a group that is uh, very strongly uh, in support of uh, humanity and uh, against the uh, would-be fascists uh, or would-be totalitarians. They haven't com uh, cemented their power yet, but they are fascists. So uh, with that in mind, though, uh, at a meeting uh, recently, someone uh, brought up the idea that maybe we should, um, since this isn't normal uh, Christmas, uh, revise some Christmas carols. And it went uh, beyond that. Uh, uh, myself and another member of our group uh, put our hands to writing some parodies. So I thought I would uh, share a few of them with you. Uh, if this goes out on the internet and uh, somehow people see or uh, uh, appreciate some of these. Uh, there are actually more <laughs> available than I have time for, but um, for example, uh, we might uh, say that uh, because of uh, the uh, so-called leader that we have in charge, that uh, we might say uh, to uh, all our fellow countrymen, O come, all ye faithful, all who love their country, O come ye, O come ye to Washington. Come and impeach him, born the worst of humans. Oh, come, let us impeach him. Oh, come, let us impeach him. Oh, come, let us impeach him. Trump, the would-be king. What we might say about, uh, about our uh, country as a whole, oh, USA, oh, USA, yeah, I'm a terrible singer, but uh, how do I worry about your fate? A uh, fascist pig who is not great. Suppress the vote to stage a coup to turn all lies, to turn to lies all that is true. Sorry about that. Oh, USA, oh, USA, it takes a movement to save you. <laughs> uh, we, might, we might look forward to uh, when um, there is more action against this uh, so-called president and the so-called uh, leaders uh, in the uh, Republican Party that uh, are fascists. Uh, we could say, fill the streets with demonstrating, follow the la 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 la, is the season to be marching, follow the la 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 la. Hold so high each sign and banner, fa la 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 Raise each voice with righteous clamor, fa la 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 Resist until we do succeed, fa la 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 Fight to stop the fascist creed, fa la 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 Never will our spirits quake, fa la 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 A better future will we make, Fa la 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 la. Okay. Get a better singer. Let's get Holkin. <laughs> all right, all right. Mr. Butler. Tis the season. Tis the season indeed. <laughs> and I'm surprised, incidentally, that uh, some people were surprised at the idea of our Christmas, a time for gift giving originally got its impetus from the Romans who <coughs> held their Saturnalia every year. It was a time when masters gave gifts to their servants. It was a time when debts 
were in many cases forgiven, sound familiar? Uh, it was a time for people to put aside even fighting wars. They tried to put that aside for just a few days. Again, sound familiar. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that religious persuasions have been stealing from each other in the best possible <laughs> way for centuries. Uh, you will find, for example, that in Christianity, in Judaism, and in Islam, there's the same goal. Serve God, serve your neighbor. Respect God, respect your neighbor. The way they go about it is different. Even in Christianity, there are something like 250 different Christian sects in the United States, each of whom is convinced that they have the true path. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is that they probably all have some semblance of the true path. It is a matter of which one works best for you. Now, I thank the Lord that I'm not saying this in the 15th century, because I would have immediately been hauled off and burned at the stake for uh, what I just said. But the truth of the matter is there's more that unites us than divides us. And we have to keep that in mind, especially now. Some people have pointed out that, uh, you know, we're, we're in the throes, uh, you know, of a terrible ordeal that this country is going to be going through. Uh, yeah, there'll probably be an impeachment. Yeah, there will probably be some pushing and shoving in Washington here uh, now and then. But the fact of the matter is, this is nothing new. <laughs> Crisis uh, is as American as apple pie. <laughs> Our parents and grandparents, one December, were waiting for what was to come next after our country had been attacked suddenly and deliberately, as Franklin Roosevelt put it, at Pearl Harbor. Two or three generations earlier, our parents, our great-great-grandparents, awaited what was going to happen as state after state walked away from the Union, and as it became apparent that everyone between the age of 18 and 60 was likely to be called up for service in Mr. Lincoln's army or in Mr. Jefferson's army. Uh, crisis is nothing new. Right now, we, 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 we think that uh, what's happening in Washington uh, is, is, is something that we never dreamed would happen in this country. What makes us think that we are so privileged, that we are so protected, that things like this which have happened in practically every other country in the world, that we're going to be spared from it? Um, this is not a time for preaching, but it is a time for reflection, and it is a time for being realistic and understanding that, yes, we're going to go through some rough times in the next few years. But I have news for you. I think we all know enough American history, and I think we all know the American character to know this too shall pass. And two or three generations from now, perhaps in a place like this, our descendants are going to be faced with a totally unexpected crisis of a totally different sort. And they're going to be saying, our great-great-grandparents, as they sat in the college of complexes, wrestled with these issues too. <laughs> it doesn't change. The human condition remains the same. And as a matter of fact, this is one of the reasons why certain eternal truths in religion, whether you're Catholic or whether you're Jewish or whether you're Muslim, uh, it all boils down to the same thing. We are subject to the service of the same God in one form or another. We are subject to duties that we have to each other in one form or another. And, you know, these, these are things that whether, whether we are in Chicago or whether we are in Rome or whether we are in the Middle East, it doesn't change. The obligations remain the same. And indeed, the opportunities remain the same. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound like Cardinal Butler. 
Uh, <laughs> the fact of the matter is that there are there are sometimes we have to look a little bit beyond uh, our current uh, world and uh, think in terms of what other people have had to deal with, what we will have to deal with, what our descendants will have to deal with, and my feeling is we're all going to come out of it one way or another in one piece. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know why everybody's so gloomy. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> for Christmas, Trump and the Republicans are going to, you know, give a billion, a trillion and a half in uh, tax breaks to the one percent in Wall Street. You should be happy about that. Unfortunately, nine million kids will be thrown off of health care insurance, but. They're poor. Anyway, um, you know, I was saw something on the internet. And it wasn't fake, I don't think. But somebody should tell Trump this. Between the mid-November and January 1st, there's like seven of the biggest religions in the world have 28 holidays. <laughs> think about that for a second. <laughs> you know, there's Christmas. And there's 27 other holidays for other religions going on right at this time of year. All right, uh, you guys put a lot of nice data and charts and information up here. Yeah. Except the problem is, when you talk about averages, is that you talk also about the 1% and the big purchases get averaged in with the schmucks like me that don't have a lot of money to spend on Christmas presents. So I'm real skeptical about, just like the average incomes, you know, guys that make $20 million a year on Wall Street and all the uh, Fortune 500s are being averaged in with, you know, the whole class, like me. Okay. <laughs> so I get a little uh, nervous about averages and numbers like that. Anyway. Um, that's about it. I just wanted to talk about the holidays and then Wall Street and then. Um, yeah, well, it's about it. Oh, and I do want to do a show on Wall Street and one percent and bailouts, and tax breaks. Why should we believe Ma your math? Well, you know what? I'm going to do a PowerPoint. You got a different kind of mathematics or something? Well, you guys just the averages like what the averages, use? huh? What are you going to use? I'm going to have charts and graphs and, and, and it's going to have actual citations. What makes your math superior to our math? <laughs> My math is better than your math. Right. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Happy holidays. Yeah, yeah. Happy holidays. Yeah. Right. <laughs> My math is better than your math. Your math. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I don't like your average. Good evening. <coughs> Santa Claus is coming to town. I know. Uh, Shirley Temple believed in Santa Claus until Santa Claus asked for her autograph. That's when she stopped believing in Santa Claus. I got a bunch of notes here. <coughs> this is the number. Uh, this session is. 3,348 session of, of this uh, almost 67 years. I hope that Charlie gets these numbers right. Somewhere he got about 100 numbers ahead for 69 years. It's, we're two weeks away from 67 uh, days of <coughs> years. <coughs> and you wonder why uh, does Santa Claus, they never mention any children. Do you know why? Because Santa Claus comes once a year. Oh. <laughs> we should have something about humor. Did you ever have anything about humor here? Well, it's just mixed <laughs> I told you a couple weeks ago. Uh, well, this is 3,348. On the 3,346 day, you learned that life is hard by the yard, but it's cinched by the inch. I heard this about 50 years ago. <clears throat> and I what the hell does that mean? Life is hard by the yard, but it's cinched by the inch. Last week I told you about um, what does uh, simplex and complex mean. Today I want to tell you that uh, Santa Claus comes only once a year, so he doesn't have any children. Humor. Laugh. 
It, it's, it's also funny, you dump on Trump. Yes. The, Mel Melania is uh, the most beautiful first lady ever, oh. bar none. <clears throat> and uh, Trump is the first one that's not a lawyer, I, I, I believe that. Yeah. Everybody wanted a president that's not a lawyer. Yeah. Trump is not a lawyer and everybody's bitching about him. It's also a dump on Trump. A penny doubled for 30 days. Kennedy wasn't a lawyer. I, what it, I, okay. was not a lawyer. <clears throat> a penny doubled for 30 days comes out to $5,368,709 and 12 pennies. 48, uh, that's uh, 2 to the 29th power. 1 to any power is still 1. 2 to the 28th power is $5.5 million. Dollars. Now, the prophecy about Christ, uh, the good old Charlie Hunter, he wished that Christ didn't, didn't exist. What about the thousands, tens of thousands of martyrs? And there are 48 prophecies. <coughs> they all came true. I don't know. <coughs> all of them at all. But if you had 48 pennies, and you flipped them up in the air, what are the chances that they would all come up heads or tails? It's it's astronomical number. They had this one guy, uh, he says, um, he, he says, what do you want? He says, I'll take a, a grain of rice and you double it for uh, 365 days in a year. And the king was not too smart. He said, oh, no, you could have had half of the kingdom. He wants 365 grains of uh, rice. But 365 grains of rice, I mean, uh, the grain of rice doubled for 365 days like in a year. It comes to an astronomical, it's, it, I think it, it covers uh, the, the solar, uh, the Earth's uh, distance in the solar system. That's how big a pile of rice it is. So when a king found out that this, the simpleton uh, fooled the king, it meant the, that guy's head, because he fooled the king. And, uh, uh, oh, Hillary. They, they said if Hillary loses, they're going to move to Canada. Hillary lost. I don't see anybody taking off for, for Canada. Yep. So that's, that's about it. I got an awful lot here. All right. Okay. Oh, he's got more. Okay, Andy, are you going to rebut? Okay. Uh, I'll keep my remarks brief. Mine are brief. And Charlie's, if he keeps his brief, we can. I have one last thing to say that I forgot before. Uh, Edmund Burke said it. Uh, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. It doesn't matter what we think if we don't do anything, right? Right. Well, the future depends on us, all the adults right now, getting our act together and doing something about climate change before it becomes irreversibly right, catastrophic for our grandchildren. Right. Thank you. Um, Jim, you want to come up? Well, wanna, why don't you go first? You wanna, uh, we'll, I'll be quick. We, uh, yeah, we've got a few minutes here, then you know, six hours to the and move out tonight. Voltaire said, I wish that my friends, relatives, and servants were all Christians, so that they would at least think twice before they throttle me. <laughs> sorry, sorry. There is one thing I learned here at the college. No matter which side of a question you fall on, we all have our beliefs, we all claim we know the truth, and nothing is going to change your minds. All right. Oh, Kevin, well, 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 <laughs> Hearken, my friends, and you shall hear of the long distance of the hearkenments and speeches of the college. Basically, it's this. I thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for all for letting us engage us in debate. And thank God we are able to do this in this country without having federal agents outside monitoring our every move. And I, How do you know they're not? Even if they are, they can get fully accessible on YouTube. Charlie, you want to come up and make your closing remarks? Oh, I don't know much to say. Okay, Charlie. I will. Yep. You guys have been feeding up on me all night here. Well, that's the, the Christians. That's, that's the norm. <laughs> the Christians. You're able to We're stand. We're just giving you a taste of the medicine. All right. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the PowerPoint there. We did. Uh, and.
take a little look at what is this ritual that we're engaged in annually. Um, little helpful hints over the years. Please do not, under any circumstances, go to a company-sponsored party. I've represented enough employees who got in trouble at these events, and um, I recommend that you take a pass on those. Uh, the one thing about this gift giving, and I don't have an answer to it myself, I guess it's one thing that's kind of enjoyable to shop for others or purchase gifts. I guess that's being, you know, you like to make a gesture or an expression towards your um, people you care about. Um, so on the other side, you're the recipient of gifts. I've never been very good at receiving gifts, but thank you, Jonathan. And if there's one thing I have oh tried to learn over the years is when it comes to Christmas, be gracious in receiving. So thank you very much. Okay. Right, Andy, you. Out, please. I'll take anything you want to give me. Okay, uh, that's it. That wraps up the I don't care. Complexes it's plastic. I don't even know what figgy pudding is.